to truth or... <laughs> Especially not some dude it up egg sucking gutter train. Baby. Renry you're as criminal as I. What do you think, Frank? I called Make a better choice. <laughs> Writing's advice. Use it. It's on every video. Welcome to the movies. From the studios of 20th Century Fox, we invite you to a sneak preview of exciting productions coming to your cinema screen. We got a fugitive on the loose here, people! He's armed, he is dangerous, and he's got himself some hostages! He thinks you're Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I am. You know what? I know. Know what? A secret. What secret? Santa Claus. I've known for a long time. He's not real. Says who? My mom. I am the parent. You are the friendly guy down the hall. They say that seeing is believing. <laughs> but the truth is, the world is held together by things you can't see. There really has to be something you want for Christmas. A house, a brother, and a dad. That's all I ever want. He loves you and he wants to kiss. You they think she's the most beautiful woman in the whole world. If you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. Right. <laughs> it's an engagement ring. If, if you can't accept anything on faith, then you're doomed for a life dominated by doubt. If I could make you believe, then there'd be some hope for me. If I can't, well, I'm finished. I want this man declared. Insane. This is about a man who has had something very wrong done to him. I want you to help him. Do you believe that you are Santa Claus? Yes, of course. Could that man be Santa Claus? No. Why not? Because Santa don't got a grumpy face. I'd like the court to see Mr. Kringle make the reindeer fly. The only fly is on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Coles believes in Santa Claus. Do you believe in Santa Claus? If this court finds that Mr. Kringle is not who he says he is, then I would ask the court to judge which is worse. A lie that draws a smile. I know it. Or a truth that draws a tear. This season, 20th Century Fox, Richard Attenborough.
Elizabeth Perkins, Dylan McDermott, and Mrs. Doubtfire's Mara Wilson present you with the most precious gift of all. Something to believe in. Miracle on 34th Street. Directed by Les Mayfield. This summer, our world will come under attack. The mayor has declared a state of emergency. By the most evil force ever known. He has armies at his command. And only one power on Earth can stop him. Welcome to my nightmare. Now. The ultimate adventure begins. Hi, honey. I'm home. You garlic sucking dingle brain! We're the Power Rangers. Ooh, where's my autograph book? More action. More adventure. More power. The ooze is back. You lose, you lose. Power Rangers, the movie. The power is on. Have you ever bought or rented a videotape that wasn't quite right? It may have been a pirate copy, an illegal and inferior copy for which you paid good money. Pirated tapes are recognisable by poorly presented or photocopied jackets, poor sound and or picture quality, the lack of sensor and other labels on the face and spine of the tape, and the absence of warnings, such as this at the beginning of the tape presentation. Pirate tapes rob artists and studios of their rightful income and add to the cost of a video to the consumer. Video piracy is a major problem in Australia. Please help us stop it. If you buy or rent a tape which you believe is not the genuine article, please phone this toll-free number for advice. Or write to Post Office Box 515 Monavale, New South Wales, 2103. This message is brought to you by the Australasian Film and Video Securities Office. The man who brought you Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Lost in Space, The Time Tunnel, and Land of the Giants. Now comes the Fantasy.
fantasy worlds of Erwin Allen. Featuring clips from your favorite TV shows. Spectacular feature films. Incredible home movies. Outtakes. And never before seen bloopers and promotional films. If you raise your hand, those that are going to get killed, raise your hand. And interviews with the people who made it happen. With your host, June Lockhart. Bill Moomy and the robot from Lost in Space. From the farthest reaches of outer space to the depths of the sea. From the top of a burning skyscraper to an ocean liner turned upside down. Erwin Allen's imagination took us on many wild adventures and made science fiction fans out of generations of audiences. Some knew him as the creator of hit shows like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Lost in Space, The Time Tunnel, and Land of the Giants. And others knew him as... The master of disaster, the producer of blockbuster movies like The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno. But for those who knew him best, he was a creative visionary, a pioneer who brought a youthful enthusiasm to everything he touched. Warning, warning, danger, danger. Warning, warning, danger, danger. Warning, warning, danger, danger. What is it, robot? My sensors indicate we are about to travel through time and see many strange things. Well, what's so scary about that? It is just that I might run into my old friend, Dr. Smith, and his insults will likely damage my audio relays. Look, don't worry about it, Robot. Nothing bad will happen to you while we're around. I will try to control myself, Will Robinson. Uh, Robot, uh, why don't you try and punch up some background information on Irwin Allen? Affirmative. Erwin Allen was born in New York City on June 12, 1916. The youngest of four boys, his passion for adventure stories and fantasy took root early. He could often be found with his nose in a book or enjoying the thrill rides at nearby Coney Island. After writing a column for his high school newspaper, Erwin studied advertising and journalism at City College in New York and Columbia University. During a brief vacation in Hollywood, he stayed on to take a position as a magazine editor. And within a year, he had his own radio show. He did a uh, sort of a Walter Winchell or Jimmy Fiddler type Hollywood gossip. He actually stood up over le leaning on a desk with his script papers and notes in front of him. And they had his own little beep, 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 beep dot and dash machine. Uh, Flash, Beverly Hills. Da -da 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 -da. This is Erwin Allen with the exclusive report. And he would give exclusive reports. And then at the end of it, I would say, thank you, Erwin, and we'll see you again next Tuesday. Erwin's popularity on radio led to a syndicated newspaper column called Hollywood Merry-Go-Round, which eventually became the first celebrity talk show ever produced on television. After a brief job as a literary agent, Erwin accepted a post at RKO Studios, where he worked as a producer on his first feature film, Where Danger Lives, with Robert Mitchum. After producing two comedies with Groucho Marx, a man who had been Irwin's boyhood idol, the two went on to become lifelong friends. Well, don't surprise me. I want you to meet an old friend of mine who's been watching you. Uh, Mr. Allen? This is a real surprise. This is uh, this is Rowena Heimway, Rowena. Uh, Heimstra, Rowena. and this is Mr. Allen. He's a big movie producer in Hollywood, and right now he's producing a very important picture over at MGM. And I asked him to be here tonight so he could see your dance. Mm -hmm. Now, Rowena, did you see the dance? How could I miss it? <laughs> what did you think of Rowena? 
She looked great on a wide screen. <laughs> you think you could use her? I not only think I could use her, but if she'll call me tomorrow morning, 6.30 in the morning will be too soon, I'll have a contract ready for you. Mm. But it was this book, The Sea Around Us, that captured the young producer's interest. Written by Rachel Carson, it had been on the bestseller list for 70 weeks. This is Irwin's own copy, and he was hooked. From all the seven seas around the world, from a hundred ports of call, from 200 deep sea expeditions, from the world's most famous oceanographers, comes the exciting drama of a thrilling world of wonders you've never seen before. The sea around us. Acquiring the rights, he gathered over 300 hours of footage from marine biologists and oceanographers from all over the world. He wrote the script and supervised the editing, which literally made him seasick. But it was worth it. The Sea Around Us won Irwin Allen the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature of 1952. After his success with The Sea Around Us, Irwin headed to Warner Brothers to do a feature about dinosaurs. Working with veteran effects wizard Ray Harryhausen, The Animal World was Irwin's first venture into the kind of science fantasy that would soon become his trademark. His next production, The Story of Mankind, was a star-studded comedy extravaganza featuring some of the most unlikely casting in the history of film. No drink and no smoke? No. What about girls? No. No girls. Huh. What about her? She my daughter. She no girl. That's what he thinks. It also featured a cost-saving strategy that would be used by Irwin on countless future projects. Irwin used a lot of stock footage. That was one of his trademarks throughout. Story of Mankind actually was a picture that was built on outtakes and stock footage. I had to match up costumes and tie in things so that they would carry on through. Wherever he could beg, borrow, or steal, <laughs> he always did. That was one way of his cutting down the budget. Ladies and gentlemen, Presenting for your delight the most exciting, the most colorful, the most spectacular entertainment of all time. I give you the thrills, the drama, the romance of the biggest show in the world, The Big Circus. As a director, Irwin modeled himself on no less a showman than Cecil B. DeMille. Like DeMille, his pictures were always colorful spectacles that freely mixed history with entertainment and adventure with humor. Starring Victor Mature as the flamboyant circus impresario, Red Buttons, hilarious as a clown, a general nuisance. How do I get down? That was my first encounter with, uh, with, with her in the big circus. And he was kind of co-directing the picture, and that kind of disturbed me a little bit. You know, we were having two directors going at the same time. The director would say, cut, print, and Erwin would get into his ear, and then he had to do another shot. But that would get came out of Erwin's enthusiasm. After the big circus, Erwin was invited to 20th Century Fox for the beginning of what would become a 14-year odyssey. of land uplifted by volcanic eruption a hundred million years ago. The land where monsters live. The Lost World took audiences back to prehistoric times. Of course, Irwin had covered this ground before, but last time, he had Ray Harryhausen stop motion effects dinosaurs. This time, Irwin only had a few lizards and some baby alligators and the help of the studio makeup department. I was working with Irwin Allen in a film called The Lost World. It was one of those pictures that the studio wanted me to do and I felt I had to do and I didn't want to go on suspension, all that sort of thing. And I was just, I, I didn't like the script, I didn't believe in the script and I was, I'd get on the set and I'd see Jill St. John in pink tights holding a poodle 
but the actors were just put together quite well. And all the monster stuff and the dinosaurs, all of that worked very, very well. And you'll be stunned by the horrifying 100-foot fire monster that guards a king's ransom in treasure. It's hard to believe that anyone could mistake lizards and alligators for dinosaurs. Maybe Irwin really was onto something. The early 1960s were a time of great change and excitement. President John F. Kennedy was opening up what he called the new frontier. America's first astronauts were helping to prove that there were no limits to the power of science, technology, and imagination. And for Irwin Allen, it marked the beginning of an explosive period of activity. You are there when the United Nations is thrown into a turmoil. You are there when the frogmen battle a mammoth squid. You are there when the entire sky catches on fire. You are there in the most startling underwater pursuit ever built. Inspired by Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Irwin's film, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, introduced the extraordinary submarine sea view to audiences all over the world. Not even the soaring imagination of a Jules Verne could have dreamed of such a fantastic adventure with a cast as exciting as the wonders they encountered. Walter Pigeon. We hope to see sights never before seen by man. Joan Fontaine. Peter Lorre. Sounds like super. Barbara Eden. <laughs> I like getting wet. <laughs> I guess I'm getting bounced around. Maybe there's a reason why I do these things. <laughs> Boots, the riding boots, and riding pants. <laughs> and he would have this gun, and before every shot, instead of saying action, he'd shoot his gun up in the air. <laughs> that threw him a little. In here is the heart, the atomic motor room. There is more destructive force in this room than in all the explosive views in World War II. Time magazine reviewed Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And they gave uh, Joan Fontaine and I the highest marks in the film. It said that we overcame everything, even our three-inch heels on a, on a submarine. <laughs> Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea was one of the biggest box office hits of 1961. And more than ever, Irwin Allen was considered one of 20th Century Fox's most valuable assets. His next film, Five Weeks in a Balloon, was again inspired by Jules Verne and told the tale of an unlikely group of travelers. As in all of Irwin's films, it featured a who's who of some of Hollywood's best known and best loved actors. Five weeks in a balloon, climb aboard and enjoy the wildest, wackiest air safari of all time. Escape disaster by a hair's breadth. Challenge the fury of a tropic storm. Enter the forbidden city of Timbuktu. And have the time of your life in the wildly exciting, wonderfully thrilling, deliriously funny comedy adventure. Five weeks in a balloon. In 1964, Irwin Allen took the big plunge into television with a weekly version of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. This is the Sea View. The most extraordinary submarine in all the seven seas. Welcome aboard the Sea View, gentlemen. I'm Irwin Allen, the producer and sometimes writer director of this new series. Using sets, costumes, and stock footage from his feature film, he dazzled audiences with one of the most spectacular pilots ever produced. <laughs> For TV's Admiral Nelson, Irwin cast veteran actor Richard Basehart. I was too close for comfort. Co-starring as Captain Lee Crane was one of the survivors of the Lost World, David Hedison. Dive! All dive! 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 All dive! Both feet ahead! Irwin called, 
and he wanted me to do a film called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And after my experience on The Lost World, I just couldn't, I couldn't face it because it was basically the same thing. So I, I turned it down. And then uh, a couple of years after that, he called me for Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the series. I turned that down. And the guy wouldn't let go. So finally, after I heard that Richard Basehart was playing the Admiral, I was terribly impressed that he got Richard. And I thought, what? God, if Richard Basehart can do this, I certainly can. No, sir, the orders are quite clear. To complete the mission, I'm to regard Seaview and her entire crew as expendable. If you have a choice, though, Captain, I assume you'll bring us all back alive. <laughs> now, here's a real treat. These are Irwin Allen's actual home movies. In them, we can get a rare behind-the-scenes look at Irwin directing that very important first episode. I think Irwin, what he was trying to accomplish was to make a very exciting, fast-paced one hour, you know, with no baloney in between. He was great to me. I liked him, but we were always arguing. I would say, Irwin, we, you know, here, Captain Crane, Admiral Nelson, there should be some sort of humor in the characters. Not so grim, but he would have none of it. He just knew that he always wanted the action to be very grim and very solid and very tense. And that's what he got. All hands, this is the captain. The attack's been canceled. And I forgot my line. The best thing we're going to do is lose those destroyers. I like... I am so glad that I finally was able to do Voyage, especially because of Richard, who was so intelligent and what a wonderful actor. And such a nice guy to have as a friend. Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> During the show's first season, Voyage, like most shows at the time, was filmed in black and white. The storylines were usually very serious and often involved renegade scientists or power-hungry foreign dictators. This man will tell you nothing. Take him out and have him shot. Bob Dowdell played the role of Executive Officer Chip Morton, and Del Monroe, the only holdover character from the feature, returned as the ever-present and ever-popular Seaman Kowalski. Well, well, I don't. Somebody's shooting at us, and they're not kidding. Her, we're on a top secret mission. I don't recall volunteering. Did you? The enormous backlot of 20th Century Fox supplied Irwin and his creative team with an unlimited range of standing sets, props, and costumes, allowing for virtually every kind of storyline. A large moat fronted a beach, which was used to represent an endless array of islands and jungle settings. The series' diving scenes and incredible special effects were produced in a tank on the back lot. The sea view itself was actually several different sized miniatures, each carefully photographed to give the illusion of size and mass. Underwater creatures were often made of latex and translucent plastics. Even a gigantic whale could be provided, courtesy of L.B. Abbott and his brilliant special effects team. Now, I bet you're all wondering what I'm doing with this metal bucket and stick. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little trade secret concerning one of Irwin Allen's most famous special effects. You know how in virtually every Voyage episode, the sea view usually gets tossed around by a giant squid or an explosion of some kind? All of that tossing and turning was what we called the rock and roll and was accomplished by having all of the actors lurch in one direction while the camera was tilted in the other direction. The actors and crew would literally be signaled by Irwin or the director banging loudly on a metal can. Everybody to the left. Right. Left. Right. 
It was cheap, but it was effective. And if you pay attention, you can see it used in virtually every episode of every one of Irwin's TV shows. As Voyage continued for three more seasons, several changes took place. In addition to being in color, the sets were modified to make them less claustrophobic. Terry Becker came aboard as Chief Sharkey, replacing the late Henry Colkey. And a surfer named Riley was added to appeal to female viewers. Man, dig that fish! Brace yourself. We needed a set that was the interior of a whale. There was no way the studio was going to spring for the money to build it. I went scouted around and he found out there was a set from Fantastic Voyage and he somehow got the key to the soundstage where that set was stored and he shot the episode inside that set that represented a human body and uh, cost next to nothing. The special effects wizards came up with a brilliant new piece of hardware, the flying sub. Capable of sailing underwater or flying through the air, the flying sub took Richard Basehart and David Hedison to places the sea view couldn't go. And sometimes with storylines that were so bizarre that even the actors didn't always want to go. He tried to get audiences with the monsters. The fossil man, the rock man, the lobster man, the this man, the that man. Exactly what did this uh, sea monster look like? I have a favorite episode. It's called The Phantom. Alfred Ryder played a, a German submarine captain. And he comes back from the dead. And he takes over my body. Put the wizard down. It is useless against me. You couldn't stop a bullet, no, Kruger. Just recently, I've watched a lot of shows. And I was terribly impressed. I thought it was very well done, which makes me think that Irwin was right. <laughs> Irwin made something pretty grand here, and I'm, uh, I'm proud to have worked with him. Colorful monsters, bizarre plots, sounds awfully familiar, but then I too was a guest star on Voyage. Oh, um, I'll invite Captain Clay. How do you do? do? It was an episode entitled The Ghost of Moby Dick, and it led to my being cast in Irwin's next project, a little television series called Lost in Space. This is the beginning. This is the day. You are watching the unfolding of one of history's great adventures. Man's colonization of space beyond the stars. In the spring of 1964, Irwin Allen pitched the networks an idea for a pilot based on the Swiss family Robinson. Like the original, it would tell the adventures of a pioneer family facing the elements alone. Goodbye, General. But with the added twist of spooky aliens, hostile planets, and weird monsters. Called the Space Family Robinson, the story concerned a family of colonists whose spaceship, the Gemini 12, is thrown off course by a meteor storm. Guy Williams, who had hung up his Zorro cape two years earlier, was cast as Professor John Robinson. June Lockhart, who had finished a long run on TV's Lassie, played his wife, Dr. Marine Robinson. Their daughter, Judy, was played by Marta Kristen, an actress who had been featured in movies and television. Angela Cartwright, who had practically grown up before American audiences in Make Room for Daddy and The Sound of Music, was Penny. And Mark Goddard, who had co-starred in The Detectives, played the pilot, Major Donald West. But I just thought it was going to be like a, uh, a kid's cartoon show, you know, on Saturday mornings. I first told my agent I didn't want to do it. And he said, do it. I just do the pilot. Take the money and run. Nobody will ever see this show. It'll never, never go on the air. Wrong, Mark. Of course, I was pretty busy myself, doing everything from feature films like Dear Bridget with Jimmy Stewart to episodes of The Twilight Zone. That is a good thing you did, Bill. That is a real good thing. Hey, don't worry, Robot. I'm not going to wish you into the cornfield or anything. 
But what about my character? You did not mention me. Well, actually, Robot, your character wasn't in the original pilot, and neither was Dr. Smith. That does not compute. That does not compute. What did compute was the budget, directed by Irwin Allen at a cost of nearly $700,000. No Place to Hide was the most expensive pilot ever produced up to that time. The Chariot was a great scene. Um, Bill and I were trying to get as wet as we possibly could. I mean, we were just kids, you know, we were teenagers. We wanted to get totally soaked, so when they would pour that water through the roof of the chariot, we tried to get as drenched <laughs> as we could. We loved that. That was a lot of fun. As I said, we were kids. It was a fun adventure to do that part. We did a pilot, and we did earthquakes in the sea, and I was working with these wonderful people, and it all came together. And, the, and my concerns were taken care of. This was a science fiction adventure. It was exciting. It wasn't the uh, cartoon thing that I thought it, that, it, that it might be. Look at this. Well, honey? Well, Erwin, he was like a little boy, in a way, because he loved, he loved the... The explosions. He, he loved all of the special effects. He he liked he liked action. Although the series would be photographed in black and white, Irwin wisely chose to film the second unit and effect sequences in color, just in case they could be used in something else later on. Now retitled Lost in Space, the show was quickly bought by CBS, but only after the network brass insisted on just two little additions. Enter the robot and Dr. Zachary Smith, played by veteran stage and screen actor Jonathan Harris. At exactly launch plus eight hours, inertial guidance system destroyed. The new story editor, Tony Wilson, had the idea of a character somewhat like Long John Silver, who would be a kind of a treacherous, hitchhiking fellow traveler whom they couldn't get rid of, and who was full of ideas for mischief, and who also formed a relationship where he was more of a father figure for the little boy than the father was. Hey, what are you doing there? You're not supposed to do that. Now, uh, who is the doctor, you or me? I immediately saw the value of this and wrote another draft of the script. And at first I had a kind of an exotic name for Dr. Smith. And again, Irwin said, no, call him, you know, a straightforward American name. And I called him Dr. Smith. And I think he was right about that. But now on to the practicalities. Only one person is currently of use to us, Major Don West. Useful because he's the only one who can pilot this spaceship. Since the others serve no purpose, they must be liquidated. When we have learned what we need to know from Major West, he will be liquidated as well. With me so far? Affirmative. Destroy everyone. I did not like that man, Dr. Smith, as written. Because of my expertise and my experience, which is, of course, vast, I knew that in four or five shows, he'd be killed off. And then I'd be jobless again, which is very boring. Well, Dr. Smith, I see you've really been hard at it. Oh, yes, indeed. A little physical exercise is so good for one. I've played many villains in my time, and my most successful villains have been comedic villains. Go away, Major. You irk me. And I began to sneak it in. And I must say... Irwin not only allowed me to do that, but one day said, do more. And I did. And the rest, as we say, is history. Computing our past efforts in relation to time spent, we should finish this job by 1415 this afternoon. One more word and your computers will suffer a concussion. 
when it debuted on Wednesday, September 15, 1965. Lost in Space was hailed by the critics as a roller coaster ride of story and special effects. There were a lot of special effects in there. A lot of sets with all kinds of contraptions that had to work at certain times. His sets were big. He'd take up the whole stage with all this stuff. It's just what he wanted. He wanted big, big, big scope. The show was a success. But it soon became apparent that the antics of Dr. Smith, Will, and the robot were overshadowing the series' other cast members. Don't be afraid, Will. Just uh, keep calm. I am. You see, these alien creatures may be very terrifying. You mustn't panic, you know. And don't tremble. Not, you are. Even though it lessened the family's uh, uh, impact on the show with Jonathan and Will and the robot, it created something for the adults to watch, uh, to really have fun with. I think it's safe to say that the two of us now constitute a voting majority. I do not vote. I am not programmed for free choice. Don't worry about it. It's vastly overrated. The remainder of Lost in Space's freshman year saw many adventures for the Robinson family and their reluctant stowaway. Highlights include The Keeper, a two-part episode with guest star Michael Rennie. Do not be frightened, I will not harm you. Welcome Stranger with Warren Oates. His footwork's gonna have to be a lot more than that if he figures on hitting me. You are even more stupid. And even a guest appearance by Robbie the Robot in War of the Robots. I can destroy you easily, foolish, sad machine. You need a small demonstration of my power. Let me at him. Let me at him. I can beat him with one claw tied behind my power pack. Yeah, good, good, robot, calm down, okay? Take it easy, you know? It's just a television show, okay? And besides, you did beat him, remember? Oh, affirmative. I did. Yeah. Speaking of robots, everyone has always been asking about who or what was inside the robot. Well, after all these years, we thought you should know. It was an actor named Bob May, seen here in these incredibly rare home movies, taken on the set by his wife, Judy. Every day, Bob would get into this elaborate metal, wood, and fiberglass costume, assisted by prop man Paul Skelton. Paul was the brother of Red Skelton, who, believe it or not, was one of Irwin's partners in the series. Warning! Warning! Destroy. Of all the Lost in Space cast members, Bobby was the unsung hero of the group. He would invent what would appear to be impossible stunts, like turning his upper body around 180 degrees, all of which were designed to make audiences believe that the robot was in fact real. Warning, 40,000 volts, now in circuit. By temper, by temper. I am not jealous. It is a human emotion. I am not jealous. It is a human emotion. What time is it? 1833 hours at the signal. William Shakespeare, 1564, 1616. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. My, you are a many splendid thing. Providing the voice for the robot was our show's own announcer, Dick Tufeld. Erwin said, my dear boy, this is a highly advanced civilization. What I want is a cultured, low-key kind of approach. So now I'm doing the lines. I'm saying, warning, warning, it will not compute. And danger will Robinson. And aliens approaching. And he said, no, that's not it. Try it again. And now in my best mechanical robotian kind of sound i say warning warning it will not compute danger will robinson and Irwin looks up and his eyes get wide and he says my god that's the approach i wanted what the hell took you so long data inaccurate does not compute does not compute does not compute 
I'd like to tell you a true story about the time that Mark Goddard and I played a little practical joke on Bobby May. One day, we all went to lunch, and, and Mark and I actually locked Bobby inside the robot suit, and we just took off and left the stage, and we left him there, and... and oh, you might know, just kind of realize something. I don't think that Mark and I ever let Bobby out of the suit. Could it be that... Uh, Bob? Bob? Oh, hi, Bill. How's our ratings on the show doing? Hey, Bob, I hate to tell you this, but the show's been off CBS for, like, 30 years. That was a long lunch. <laughs> yeah, I think you can come out now. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> what some people won't do to be in show business. It's a job. <laughs> it's, it's a good job. It's real good. Yes. When Lost in Space returned for its second season, it did so with a bang. <laughs> Free to travel the galaxy in search of Alpha Centauri, the Robinsons, Major West, and Dr. Smith would encounter many strange worlds and even stranger aliens. When the aliens were good and convincing, and there was some kind of theme to the story, then it wasn't so bad. I shall destroy you. When it turned really comedy, and it got really, really silly, <coughs> those are the ones I didn't like. I wouldn't say it's so ridiculous. I uh, had this opportunity to uh, to play Brunhilde in, in uh, Space Vikings. me in on a big white horse with uh, wonderful white wings and there I am and I go like I said pure camp <laughs> I played a, a, a villainous, uh, I don't know what, soothsayer or uh, magician or something. I had the scene where I had to talk Jonathan Harris into going on this rocket ship. Dr. Smith, you're late. I was beginning to think you changed your mind. And just before shooting it, Don Richardson, the director, came over to Dallas. We're short three minutes. So I said, Jonathan, come over here. I'll show you what we used to do in burlesque called the hesitation waltz. It's very easy. As I walk you up the gangplank, take the first step to go in, spin on that leg and turn, and come back, walk to me and say, Mrs. Alfred. Yes, Dr. Smith. My suitcase. Oh, my suitcase. Thank you. Well, we did this five, six, seven times, and he had his three minutes. Oh, oh, Dr. Smith! Yes, yes, yes. Your safety helmet. We used to do that in Burwest. It, it's an old uh, bit, and it worked, you know. And it's on Lost in Space. Oh, thank you, Gypsy Rose Lee. The creatures of Lost in Space were made by Paul Zostomievich, our talented costume designer. Oh, handsome, pretty, handsome. Duke de Smith? Oh, no, 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 my dear. You mustn't, mustn't. Paul Z, as we affectionately called him, was also Irwin's assistant. 
and he was kept busy supplying all sorts of weird, wonderful designs. Sometimes the designs were so wonderful and economical that Irwin liked to use them again and again and again in episodes of both Lost in Space and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. The most fabulous monster that I did was the one-eyed Cyclops in uh, Lost in Space. And that was made out of palm tree bark. I had the uh, paint department process it and fireproof it, and then we got it back up to wardrobe and we sewed it over a union suit and we made the Cyclops outfit out of that. The reason the moth never moved was because Irwin said it wasn't important and it would cost too much money to form a plaster cast and make it believable. So we always hid the, the dental work, so to speak. In that era in which we, we filmed Lost in Space, uh, technology was very different than it is today. It sort of has a feel of like a homemade movie with the fake rocks and the spaceship and the way we were dressed and it, uh, the design of the show, the style of the show. I think the legacy that, that Irwin leaves with the series is that uh, people can go and watch it and have a good time and know that everything isn't so serious. Relax, Dr. Smith. Our arrival on the planet Delta is being hailed by a spectacular display of electronic pyrotechnics. 1967 was the age of Aquarius, and as Lost in Space entered its third and final season, the Robinsons got a pretty significant makeover, courtesy of Paul Z and our brilliant art department. Even the show's opening credits were spruced up by an exciting new theme song, written by our series composer, the incomparable John Williams. John went on to do such famous motion picture scores as Jaws, Star Wars, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. His work on Lost in Space remains some of the best ever done for a television series. season, the Robinsons got more chances to journey through space. They ran into space hippies in The Promised Planet. It's like Freaky Man, real freaky. We're gonna freak out together. Landed back on Earth only to find out that it was Earth in 1947 in A Visit to a Hostile Planet. I suggest we leave before those jokers really get me riled up. And battled evil twin Robinsons in what many consider one of the series' best episodes, The Anti-Matter Man. Yes, we are alike, aren't we? Who are you? I asked you who you are. I'm Professor John Robinson. Everyone knows that. Fans always like to ask us, what was our favorite episode? And if we uh, really want to be naughty, we we'll usually answer... The Vegetable People. The Great Vegetable Rebellion. The Vegetable Rebellion. The Great Vegetable Rebellion. The Great Vegetable Rebellion. But I assure you, my dear sir, I adore vegetables. I always have. They're so full of vitamins and minerals and all good things. You'll be pleased to know that I eat them regularly, cooked or raw. Did you hear that, Lily? He eats vegetables! He enjoys eating vegetables! The Vegetable Rebellion was un unbelievable. I was a celery, yes, a celery. Will you kindly tell this creature to stop nibbling at me? It jars me to my very roots. Peter Packer had written it, and he was one of our good writers. And when I read the script, I was, of course, appalled at the idiocy of it. And I went to Peter and I said, what is this? And he said, I didn't have another goddamn idea in my head. Ivo, you must be getting awfully tired of playing this game with us. Tired? I've barely started. 
I have scenes, yes, where I, get, I break up. A lot of times you'll see me kind of just going like this out of the scene, you know, and just not looking at anybody. Strange, I seem to be losing pressure. That's, you know, it's hard to, you know, talk to a carrot if you've never talked to a carrot. I mean, how do you talk to a carrot? <laughs> You know, when we were filming The Great Vegetable Rebellion, Guy Williams and I couldn't stop giggling. Irwin got so angry at us that he had us written out of the next two episodes. Since its debut in syndication, Lost in Space has continued to delight fans all across the country and all over the world. Y ahora adelante. Gracias, Professor Robinson. In December of 1990, Lost in Space celebrated its 25th anniversary with a huge convention held in Boston. It was attended by over 32,000 fans. But even more impressive are the legions of fans who credit the show with inspiring them to become scientists, astrophysicists, and even astronauts. Not to mention those who have gone into the arts as writers, actors, or film technicians. It's a legacy all of us who were connected with the show are really quite proud of. And you know, I think Guy Williams would have felt the same way. Absolutely. Two American scientists are lost in the swirling maze of past and future ages during the first experiments on America's greatest and most secret project, the Time Tunnel. Tony Newman and Doug Phillips now tumble helplessly toward a new fantastic adventure somewhere along the infinite corridors of time. The fall of 1966 was a good time for sci-fi and fantasy addicts. Voyage was still going strong, as was Lost in Space, now, believe it or not, holding its own opposite Batman. Even Star Trek made its debut that year on NBC. But on Friday nights, right after the Green Hornet on ABC, we could catch the adventures of Dr. Tony Newman, played by James Darren. And Doug Phillips, played by Robert Colbert. As with every Irwin Allen production, the pilot, titled Rendezvous with Yesterday, was carefully planned and storyboarded. Compare these sketches for the opening sequence with the version as it appears in the final film. This is a red alert. Red alert. All time tower personnel report to their stations on the double. Irwin would go to any length to make it look exactly like what the storyboard was. So when I saw it, when I saw what Irwin had had storyboarded, and then eventually saw this incredible set, which was exactly like the storyboard, but grand, of course, it was breathtaking. It helped you in your character. You fantasized when you were there. To devise the look of the series' most important set, the tunnel itself, Irwin employed virtually every graphic artist and designer he knew eventually settling on this design. So that's the monster that's cost us all this money. Hmm? It was enormous. It took two sound stages. It had a hypnotic effect. And just as the, the characters were drawn into the tunnel and taken back into time or forward into time, so was the audience former Miss America and former big screen Catwoman, Lee Merriweather, played Dr. Ann McGregor, along with John Zaremba as Dr. Raymond Swain and Whit Bissell as Lieutenant General Haywood Kirk. We're looking back into time to what's happening. It's a fascinating idea. Can it possibly exist? Can there be somebody floating around somewhere in that thing we call time? I'm one of the men in charge of this nation. 
You must be new here. I'm Dr. Newman. I'm back. I've been here 14 months, mister. I never heard of you, Dr. Newman. 14 months? But I've been here every day for the past seven years. What's the problem, soldier? Jigs? Jigs, it's me, Dr. Newman. Newman? I don't have any Newman around here. What are you talking about? You know me. Tony Newman. The pilot episode, which Irwin directed, had a very good feel about it. And once I got into it and realized even more about what this whole time travel thing was about and how interesting it could be week after week, then it became intriguing to me. I mean, you're in Krakatoa one day, you're on the moon the next. We had the finest stages, the finest sets, the finest uh, location shots. And uh, from, from our close-up vantage point, it was all so classy and so well done. Minus 45. Launch minus 40 and counting. It's a rocket. Tony, this is one of those early canal roll jobs. We could be blown up right here on the pad. Titanic. We will kill Abraham Lincoln. I couldn't wait for what might happen next week. Script-wise, you know, if something come in, we would travel to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, or whatever it might be. Who are you? What are you doing here? What we are does not matter. We are here to destroy. But as the settings and situations offered the viewers visual variety, some felt that the format of the show was becoming predictable. It's going to be hard for you to understand. But we're time travelers. You've got to believe me. You are under arrest. Arrest? What do you want with us? We've done nothing to you. How dare you insult my intelligence with the wild tale of traveling in time? You could look at it and say, my God, this is going to be the same thing every week. But I think... The stories that took place, the little personal stories of the people involved in those scripts, I think that's what made it interesting to us as actors. Something's very wrong with their timetable. I don't know what it is, but it's wrong. I was always there fixing it. I think I probably made more mistakes than any, anyone else on the show as far as losing them and, and not being able to track them. What happened to your time fix? I don't know. It's supposed to be midday. We acted a lot to... Um, little sticks with little round circles and faces drawn on them for one would be Jimmy and one would be Bob. <laughs> and and uh, we would uh, pretend that they were in some sort of peril usually. Our only problem was in finding out exactly what kind of danger were they in. Of course, not every episode stuck to the same formula. In the day the sky fell down, one of the best and most dramatic episodes of the series... Tony and Doug land at Pearl Harbor on the eve of the Japanese attack. Here, Tony encounters his own father, knowing that he will soon be a casualty. Have we met before? Yes. Many years ago. The situation in, within that, that horrible thing at Pearl Harbor was what was interesting to me as an actor, to go there and to, to see myself as a child. Can Billy and me stay up later tonight? Can we, Daddy? It seems to me. And then to see my dad, who I had not seen since that time, because, of course, he was killed in Pearl Harbor. Tony Newman. I know you. I know you as well as I know my own son. I... I am your son. <laughs> Good to know my little boy was so long. Of course, it wasn't all work and no play for the Time Tunnel support staff. What is this place? Occasionally, even Lee Merriweather and Whit Bissell got into the action. I was thrown back in time to the French Revolution. And I played the part of a French officer who was an ancestor of mine. Louis XVII? No, I, I will not permit 
it. It's impossible. My ancestors came from Scotland, France. Well, you must admit it's a rather startling resemblance. kidnapped by Victor Jory, playing a pirate, and I was just in the heat of the moment, you know, jammed up against the side of it, so... Oh, my nylons were all running and blood was running down my leg. I can still carry a couple scars from... <laughs> From, from the set. Of course, getting Tony and Doug to different exotic and historical locales every week didn't come cheap. But when things got tight, Irwin could always take advantage of 20th Century Fox's vast library of stock footage. When we had Kyber riflemen, we had 20,000 Kyber riflemen, see. We didn't just have six guys uh, out of the stunt union coming out there riding old nags. We had some great great uh, stock footage shots. I thought it was intercut beautifully. It made the production look like it was five times as, it, as costly as what it actually was. I mean, that fools people today. He was a pioneer. He was a man who always knew what was going on on all of his sets, all of his scripts, all of his writers, directors, crews, cast. He was the consummate professional producer. Irwin, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was all right. He, he was a very sensitive man. He hired good people and and that's why they've stuck with him all those years because they could relate to almost anything he did even though it's fantasy but fantasy we live in fantasy more than we live in reality and i think that's why there's always a place for an urban home although the time tunnel was one of irwin's personal favorites it lasted just one season and despite the fact that there were only 30 episodes produced it continues to be an audience favorite around the world Erwin Allen really was ahead of his time. Trapped in the giant laboratory. The attack of the giant goldfish. Refuge in a giant egg crate. A moment of sanctuary. Then, but well, there can be no sanctuary in the land of the giants. Setting the then future of 1983, Irwin's fourth television series, The Land of the Giants, premiered September 21st, 1968. The pilot episode concerned the passengers aboard a futuristic airliner traveling from Los Angeles to London. What's happening to us? What's that thing out there, ma'am? We uh, hit some kind of strange time warp, some big green ball, and then we were on this place where everything was 12 times larger. To some kind of parallel world. It's trying to see. Like a magnet. What they encounter when they crash land is more than they or the audience can comprehend. Stay where you are, please. It's the funniest looking London fog I've ever seen. It really is London. Maybe we'd better go out to see where we are. Irwin 
Goodwin had been developing his idea for Land of the Giants for nearly two years, and of course, directed the critical first episode himself. He knew exactly what he wanted. There was no vacillating. I mean, this is the shot for everybody, uh, for the actors, for the camera, for lighting, for everybody, sound. He knew everything. Irwin told his set designers to think big. He wanted them to build a world large enough for giants to live in. sci-fi blockbusters, Irwin Allen didn't have computers or digital effects. When you saw big props on the screen, there were big props in the studio. His sets were among the most expensive and elaborate ever made for a television series. It was enormous. The the, the set where uh, where the ship you know had, had crashed into. I mean, it was you know 360 degree cyclorama surrounding you know two sound stages with uh, these huge trees and you know it, it was incredible. Marker. He was absolutely in love with this stuff, and you could see it. I mean, he would just get starry eyed when he'd come down to the set. It was his playground. It was his big toy. And he would bring his friends down to see, you know, what new toy he had. Because Irwin was, uh, was a kid, and so was I, and so I kind of recognized what he was doing. <laughs> shot the first episode before we ever saw what it, how it was going to be put together we felt so foolish you know standing there going you know looking up at the click light and and pretending but when it was all put together and we saw how Irwin was a magician and he made it work it was more different for me because I was more into concentrating and, and uh, eyeballing somebody or getting into their head and when you talk to a spotlight and there's nobody there it was a little different that's all the most humorous moments would happen when you thought you were maybe talking to a giant and that was what your whole emotional fabric would be all about you're making a mistake and then later on when they cut you found that actually you were talking to a giant chicken there was one hand that was every giant's hand he's gonna have to have this radio and uh, after a while we swore it had, had a life of its own because it was it could be a very mischievous hand it's constantly coming in and scooping us up and then flipping over and we'd fall out the other side it never quite worked but uh Irwin loved that hand. You know, that hand was very important to him. One squeeze of his fingers, that's all it takes. The, the scotch tape over the old bod, that was kind of ridiculous, you know. Oh, that gave us the giggles when uh, Gary and I were on the slab, you know, under the microscope. And because of the giant props, Land of the Giants was the most physically challenging of all Irwin series. The actors had to be in top physical condition and often perform their own stunts. When you saw us climbing those ropes, I mean, that was us. Damn, freeze! If 
eventually they got some people in there for us to to do stunts for us, you know, later on. Of course, not all the dangerous stunts were handled by the stuntmen. During the filming of The Chamber of Fear, the script called for Don Matheson to fall into a giant revolving gear and pretend to be unconscious. I hit that plank just dead center. I said, this is beautiful to myself. And my eyes closed. I'm unconscious. And then all of a sudden, something whacked me in the back of the head. Nobody caught it. It looked great on film. It looked it looked very real. And Deanna was in the shot, and she was hysterical. She almost fell off the scaffolding because she thought it was, you know, thought it was funny. Barry, I'm interested. He's always held that against me. He's never forgiven me. <laughs> Where I always let let his head get cut off, right? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, I'm tried. You know, I mean, I didn't try to cut it off. I tried to help, but. You know, he was in serious trouble. And it was, they just kept grinding. <laughs> I mean, this is great acting. Help! Help anyone! Ambulance! Help! 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 <laughs> oh, thank heaven. Dying! Oh, oh, dying! Operator! Help. Of course, all these physical dangers paled in comparison to those posed by the giants themselves. Not only were they big, they were strange. <laughs> So strange that even Irwin and the cast weren't entirely sure just who they were supposed to be. In the first few episodes, it was really a different world. There was a different written language. Giants initially moved slowly. Uh, their voices were muffled and bellowed, and you, you couldn't understand them. It appeared to be a very different world a different planet do you understand me yes we understand you must tell me everything where are you from from los angeles it was very difficult to interact with the giants which it became clear we had to do if they spoke a different language or they couldn't be understood that wasn't going to play so with very little explanation to anyone it just change i apologize for having done this to you please forgive me we really discovered that you know this giant land was uh was a, a real fascist dictatorship and there was a secret police and and it got it got quite paranoid actually I mean, it, it was very strange and we had you know the little people were sought after as almost like political criminals and you know captured to use uh, against uh, you know, in this sort of corrupt, uh, uh, dictatorial government. So, we've captured two of them. We're trapped. Land of Giants became a phenomenal hit in, in, in many countries that uh, had uh, what we would call totalitarian societies. And they said, well, this is, you know, the little people against, against the government, you know. Why should we believe you? Please listen to me. Under our form of government, phones are tapped. The walls have ears. They could have overheard you when you called me at the hospital. I couldn't take that risk. When they took Land of Giants off the air, there was the biggest protest that had ever been in Romania. Something like two or 300,000 people had made a, some kind of protest the fact that they were taking it off. Although Land of the Giants was cancelled after just two seasons, the show continues to be popular all over the world. The Giants! Especially in England, where devoted fans publish dozens of books, magazines, and newsletters concerning the show and its cast members. <laughs> just like Tony and Doug in the Time Tunnel, and all of us lost in space aboard the Jupiter 2, the little people of Land of the Giants are still trapped out there waiting for something or someone to bring them home safely. 11.56 p.m. A massive undersea earthquake drives a towering wall of water across the Mediterranean, 130 miles northwest of Crete. In 1970, after conquering television, Irwin Allen returned to making movies. But not just any movies. His would be among the most ambitious ever to hit the screen. At midnight on New Year's Eve, the 
SS Poseidon is hit by the 90-foot tidal wave and capsized. Of the 1,400 people on board, only a few will survive. The success of the Poseidon adventure was by no means a sure thing. The executives of 20th Century Fox had just had a string of costly and unprofitable pictures, and they balked at what they considered to be Irwin's folly. Here on the soundstage at the 20th Century Fox Studios, a cast and crew of over 400 skilled technicians and performers are at work on one of the most complicated and elaborate films ever made. The film costs so much money, and 20th was well, not the, the full investor in it. He had to go outside for financing, and it took him a couple of years to get anybody to believe that this was what it was. The most exciting escape adventure of our time. Irwin was at his best in the Poseidon adventure. His imagination, putting it together, you know, Fox didn't want to do it. They didn't want to go for a five million dollar budget, I understand, They're only two and a half million, and Irwin got together with two of his friends, they took a loan, and I think they paid it back in 10 days. Securing outside financing, Irwin Allen assembled a first-rate creative and production team under the direction of Ronald Neem. You'd be astonished at how much of the really, really tough work the, the, uh, the, the stars have done themselves. Because I did give a solemn warning to every member of the cast. I said, now look, before the film is over, you're all going to hate my guts, but I can't help it. With an all-star cast that included Gene Hackman. We're cut off from the rest of the world. They can't get to us. Maybe we can get to them. Ernest Borgnine. Now look, preacher, I've had just about enough out of you. Who do you think you are, God himself? Shelley Winters. Can you see Mr. Scott in the water? I'm a very skinny lady. Red buttons. Believe me, in time, you'll, you'll find other things, other people. Someone else to care for you. You'll see. And Roddy McDowell. I gather there's an exit on all decks. Yeah, just like this one, sir. It doesn't look very promising, does it? No, it doesn't. The Poseidon Adventure became 20th Century Fox's highest grossing film of the year. Nominated for eight Academy Awards and winning two. One for best song and another for outstanding visual effects. And I think he's one of the last of the truly original producers who would never take no for an answer and were full of ideas and puts on uh, outrageousness and really stayed in with their concept and defied the law of possibility. The Poseidon Adventure, of course, being one of those projects which um, certainly was not an easy ship to launch. <laughs> Probably some of the most exciting moments that I've ever witnessed was uh, some of the scenes in, in Poseidon with the water crashing through and Irwin way up on the thing yelling action and he had quite a loud voice he was really in his element doing that kind of thing this is the studio this is the man who gave you the biggest grossing picture in the world during the past year I would call a production meeting. Full staff, please. Yes, sir, right away. In 1972, the phenomenal success of the Poseidon Adventure gave Irwin the nickname of the Master of Disaster, and the pressure to top himself became enormous. This is it. This is the big one. This is the towering inferno. This is the picture, ladies and gentlemen, that we here at 20th Century Fox believe will be the biggest grocer of next year. Bigger, we think, and hope even then the Poseidon Adventure. Well, that's a large order to fill, but we have very good reasons for making that promise. We'd like to let you in on them. Often describing it as the Poseidon Adventure in the air, Erwin Offred, Paul Newman, and Steve McQueen, something they've both been looking for for 15 years, the opportunity to star in a film together. Architects. Yeah, it's all our fault. Now, you know there's no sure way for us to fight a fire or anything over the seventh floor. But you guys just keep building them as high as you can. Hey, are you here to take me on or the fire? 
By the time shooting began on May 1st, 1973, other cast members included Fred Astaire, Richard Chamberlain, Jennifer Jones, Faye Dunaway, and Robert Wagner. Don't go. I'll be back with the whole fire department. I've never worked with anyone that has been more prepared than Irwin was. Let's go to the next camera, Joe. All right. Now, where's the man? Get them all in position. Let them start tying themselves down. Thank you. Bill Holden tied down. Jerry, would you tie Mr. Newman down? Now we're all ready for the clean. If anything happens to me, Allie gets my pickup truck. <laughs> All right, the fire brigade, ladies. All right, now that I have your attention, please. We will start off by lighting the pilots, bringing up the fire, putting in the smoke. We will then roll the cameras. After we roll the cameras, I will call for water. I will call action. I will count one. Two, three, and somewhere on the way to ten, a pistol shot will go off. And within two seconds after that, the big explosion will occur. He really would come in in the morning and sit down and have meetings with different people and have it all laid out. I mean, he knew exactly what was going to happen. And that was very fortunate because no one was hurt on Towering Inferno. There wasn't one accident on the picture. Camera number one, Marcus. Camera number two, Marcus. Camera number three, Marcus. Camera number four, Marcus. Camera number five, Marcus. We now have a speed on all of the cameras. I will call action and then it'll be a count of ten. hands-on person, you know, he was right there, every scene, no matter who was in it. These were movies that even if you weren't working that day or that week, or the stars even, would come and stand around to watch the other people doing these spectacular things. I've never known of a movie where people come when they're not working and stand around to watch. They did on both of these movies. And there'll be secretaries and receptionists down here. Everything burns here. Of the 57 sets used for the Towering Inferno, only eight remained undamaged by the end of the film. And when the smoke cleared, the Towering Inferno had become a blockbuster hit all over the world. The Towering Inferno, a spectacular adventure of escape and rescue as the world's tallest building becomes a towering inferno. On 65, the whole reception area is on fire. Now, stuff him under the door. There's something on 81. Now, I'm the door! Well, I just called Fangs on 82. We got problems. I went up to San Francisco with uh, Sheila and, and Irwin to open the picture there. He probably had seen the picture conservatively 50 times. I had seen it twice. I got up and left. I went out to dinner. And so did most of the actors. We all kind of trickled out. But he sat there right at the very end. He wanted to see what the audience was thinking. Every place he went, he sat through the whole picture. 
Uh, can you imagine? I mean, he sat through all the pre-production, post-production, directed it, got the actors, got the script, put everybody together. But he loved it. He loved it. He did it. The Towering Inferno received eight Academy Award nominations, winning three. But perhaps Irwin Allen's greatest acknowledgement came from firefighters all over the world, hundreds of whom sent their helmets as a sign of gratitude. The 1970s were a period of, of great productivity for Irwin Allen and his creative team. In addition to producing blockbuster movies like The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno, he continued to develop ideas for television, including The Man from the 25th Century, a sci-fi thriller about an alien who was sent to enslave the Earth. The moment has come for you to return to Earth. Your mind has been cleansed of all false loyalties, and you're aware that people of your world are still ruthless, cruel, and stupid children. We are 500 years ahead of you. Believe in us. We understand these things. And remember, your mission to destroy the Earth Project Delphi is vital. And City Beneath the Sea, about an underwater city of the future. Yes, you'll be right here. General. Well, Temple? I'm worried about that red alert. What's the reason for it? The emergency condition at the case out of Project Mole. Subsurface lava pressure is breaking through. All right, you're the consulting engineer. What's your recommendation? Abandon the project. No. Washington wants more completed on schedule at all costs. Unfortunately, these concepts didn't sell. What did sell was... <laughs> The sea claimed all who left the dying ship. Only one family, attacked by accident in their cabin, survived. They began to build a new life. They faced unknown dangers to survive. Imprisoned in paradise, they were the Swiss Family Robinson. The Swiss Family Robinson with Martin Milner, Pat Delaney, Cameron Mitchell, and a very young Helen Hunt. Many a meal she brought me, he said. Rabbits and squirrels. How can you talk that way at supper? And numerous TV movies like The Adventures of the Queen, The Time Travelers, a thinly veiled remake of The Time Tunnel, and a two-hour version of City Beneath the Sea, starring Stuart Whitman and Robert Wagner. As if television and movies weren't enough, Irwin also joined with 20th Century Fox in the enormous task of redesigning one of Southern California's favorite tourist attractions, Marineland USA. As the studio's resident, Walt Disney, he created several new themed exhibits, including Winter Wonderland, where desert-dwelling patrons could enjoy the thrills of snow and ice in 80-degree temperatures. Irwin and Fox even had plans to build a Hollywood-themed amusement park called Pleasure Island. First thing is the relationship with the Queen Mary, that marvelous old girl that was brought over to Long Beach, sitting up at the head of what will become Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island now is virtually 100% water. When we get through with it, the 475 acres, most of it, will be landfill. Unfortunately, Irwin's theme park ideas never came to pass, and a change in management at 20th Century Fox prompted Irwin to move to Warner Brothers in 1975. Warner Brothers built a building for him, an office building for, for him, that looked like the Palais Royal. And he was like a kid. Ah, look, <laughs> he, just, he just loved it all. His office was like a kid's dream of what a mogul's office is. It was two stories, and uh, uh, I mean, one room was faulted, so it was insane. <laughs> In his new office at Warner Brothers, Irwin continued to develop and produce the kind of big disaster films that had become his trademark. But one time, disaster came a little too close to home. I remember when... The, they had the big fire in Bel Air, and finally I, I drove up the hill with him, and we got in right into the middle of the blaze, was just coming down the hill, and 
He looked at the house, he didn't know what to grab. And I grabbed his Oscars for the sea around us. And we just got out of the house barely, and we got in the car when this tree exploded right on the edge, and we got down the hill. Irwin made use of this brush with danger as the basis for two highly successful television movies, Fire and Flood, co-starring Rodney McDowell. I was involved in just a, a tiny portion of it. I don't know if I died or... I don't think I died in that one. No. In the decade that followed, Irwin continued to think big, producing an impressive series of visually spectacular films. Irwin cast me in Beyond the Poseidon Adventure. And I was really kind of excited about it because I was with Michael Caine and Sally Field and all these really great people. So I was looking forward to being in it. And uh, once again, the effects were very, very important. And thank God for Michael Caine. He always checked everything out first. He always made sure that everything was safe. In 1985, Irwin undertook a project that was for him the culmination of a lifelong dream an all-star musical version of Alice in Wonderland. With music and lyrics by his good friend Steve Allen and featuring 36 guest stars, 19 songs and over 40 optical effects, the four-hour production was one of the most ambitious of his career. Uh, when he asked me to uh, write the songs, the, the score for the Alice in Wonderland uh, production, uh, he came to me with, as I say, that sort of football coach kind of enthusiasm with the biggest selection of stars ever to be, I think, uh, certainly on a TV show. Wonderful, wonderful. People we'll never see together again. The Alice in Wonderland thing was a, a terrific show. It was expensive, but it also uh, was a different kind of a show. It was a musical, still had monsters in it, you know. But uh, I tried to play away from the monster, and he kept playing to it. And, you know, you always got to get that monster in there. He never thought in terms of, of trying to uh, get a message across to anybody. Never. It's just entertaining himself for the audience. After producing Outrage, a thought-provoking courtroom drama, Irwin was planning an all-star musical version of Pinocchio. And there was even serious talk about a big-screen theatrical version of Lost in Space. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these projects, like many, many others, would never be produced. On November 2nd, 1991, Irwin Allen died of a heart attack in Los Angeles, California. Over 350 people attended his memorial service. I would say the two words that you associate most with Irwin, give me more and make it bigger. More, more, more. He was a, a superb executive producer. He really was. Hands on, not only hands on, feet on and mouth on lost in space and everything else that takes a little doing he had a fascination for you know futuristic uh, type things and I think that he liked things larger than life and and I think that that was the feeling that he projected with people around him that he was larger than life I would go and do anything for Irwin I enjoyed being in his projects they had uh, they had imagination to them and scope and some of them worked, some of them didn't. When they worked, they were fantastic. They uh, had a real style about it. If I had to choose one word about Irwin, I would say passion was the key word. I mean, every frame in the movie was worked out with passion. The very fact that he was able to do shows that other people might think were outrageous uh, was a, a evidence of his courage. This was his vision. And he had the courage to follow through. So few people do. What he turned out um, is etched in our memory <clears throat> to this day. Um, and I suspect will be for many more decades to come. Irwin was a great salesman, producer, all of that. He had uh, great enthusiasm. And uh, you would go into his office and you would, you would kind of feel good, like this was going to be the most wonderful thing that ever happened. He was a joy to watch when I wasn't in a scene. I would love to watch him direct. He was just, he was interesting. He loved the movies. He wanted to be in the movie business. He wanted to be a producer. And he was. And he's one of the best ones we ever had. Whether it's films about fires and floods, 
or television series about space and time. Erwin Allen left behind a vast and enduring legacy that will entertain audiences for generations to come. What do you say, robot? I say that does compute. <laughs> Listen, Bob, I think we can come out of there now, huh? You worked hard. It's hot in here. Come on out. Come on out. Bob? Bob? <laughs> Looks like a little more of Irwin's movie magic. Affirmative. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of movie magic, maybe we can fire up the old Jupiter too and go home and stuff. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs> May one assume that the instructions are firmly implanted in your so-called brain. At exactly launch, plus eight hours, initial guidance system, destroy. Exactly so. And this time, get it right, you bubble-headed bobby. <laughs> Come to something or other at 5.15 in my cabin. The 70s were a great period of productivity for Irwin Allen and his. Sorry, I fell over the sand dune. To be or I'm up. I was so caught up in just seeing you two in character. Oh, I got a little for <laughs> This is Dick Tufel speaking. And I want to thank my mother, my father, my director. Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. Your last chance to own the original Star Wars is almost gone. Buy it today or lose it forever. They were total strangers. Is the seat taken? <laughs> Stop it. Fellas, lady doesn't want to be bothered. <laughs> Two people from different worlds. He's going to kill me. Who? My father. Well, look, it's none of my business, but... I'm pregnant. If I come home without a husband, he'll kill me. They had nothing in common. Well, how about if you do show up with a husband? But a secret. Stays one night, leaves in the morning. Someone tell me what is going on. Your daughter. She is married. <laughs> it's wonderful. We can sleep in Pedro's room. You need room to maneuver. Mommy. From the acclaimed director of Like Water for Chocolate. We call it Las Nubes. It means the clouds. Comes a story of enchantment. It's a special time. It's a time of magic. <laughs> We never heard the whole story of how you two met. I was on leave in June. I mean, July. A story of family. 
This is the root of our lives. Now that you are part of us, it is the root of your life. One moment, Papa. A story of a love that began with a lie. Tell me what's going on here. That you sleep one night on the floor, the next on the couch. And the truth, they were the last to know. I want you more than anything, Victoria. But I'm not free. Well, we think they feel they are creatures of the heart. Victoria, please. You can't help me anymore. You deceived me. You are already married. Victoria! 20th Century Fox presents Keanu Reeves, Giancarlo Giannini, Anthony Quinn, and Itana Sanchez Guillon. A walk in the clouds. Wow, when a trip to Washington, D.C. All expenses paid. VIP tour. Woohoo! Who would have guessed reading and writing would pay off? Yes, sir. Can I get you something? Playing cards, notepad, aspirin, sewing kit, pilot's wing pin, propeller shaped swizzle stick, sleeping mask, and anything else I've got coming to me. <laughs> Little boy, I bet you'd like to visit the cockpit. Oh, <laughs> baby. <laughs> We're all gonna die! <laughs> Look, Marge, that guy has the same last name we do. Wow, a shoehorn, just like in a movie. Duke goes on, Duke goes on, Duke goes on, Duke goes on. <laughs> oh, stupid welcoming mint. Hello. Good morning. This is your wake-up call. Wake-up call? It's 2 a.m. Sorry, Sam, though. Ah, Rudy, my man. You're a miracle worker. Your laundry, sir. There you go. Buy yourself something nice. Thank you. All right, are you ready to go to... Ah! I'll room service you. Before you kill me, remember, this trip is all expenses paid. <laughs> now on home video. Claudia Schiffer, perfectly fit. I developed this routine with my trainer, Kathy Kaler. It's simple, it works, and you can do it anywhere. Filmed on the exotic island of St. Bart's and in the historic city of Prague, Perfectly Fit is a series of two body part specific videos focusing on upper and lower body muscle conditioning for a total workout that delivers the results you need for the body you want. Perfectly Fit teams Claudia Schiffer and trainer to the stars Kathy Kaler to work your arms, shoulders, chest, back, and abs. Trim, tone, and strengthen your legs, hips, and buttocks. Purchase one video to work in a specific area or both to work to perfection. Okay, remember you used to take a big step out, and the main thing is to remember to have that knee right over your ankle in front. Good, and push back. And then on the squats, pull your stomach in as you go down. And as you come up, stay real tight and squeeze together as you lift. This workout isn't too difficult. It's very effective and very, very safe. Tone, shape, and strength. Get perfectly fit. I've been doing this exercise for a long time now. I'm stronger and have much more energy. It's not about how much you can do, and it's not about keeping up. It's about doing what's right for you, taking yourself where you can. Perfectly Fit, coming soon to home video.
Please rewind this cassette before returning it to your video library.